I'm joined by John O'Connor from RealFi. How you doing, John? And how was Rare Evo? You enjoy Vegas? Rare Evo was fun. It was uh, it was my first time in Las Vegas, so quite an experience. But yeah, the conference was great. It was really great to catch up with all of the Cardano community. So John, you've been working in the Cardano ecosystem for a while now. Tell us a bit about your background. I was the first hire at Cardano Foundation. I've worked in the Cardano ecosystem for probably more years than I can count now. I was at, originally at the foundation, then moved over to Impa Alpa. I've held a variety of roles. I was head of strategy, head of ecosystem, and then at IO, uh, director of African operations. And uh, yeah, really, I'm very focused on emerging markets, on the confluence of technology, finance, and what we can do with driving impact in those places that need it most. For the uninitiated, can you give us a quick intro to your work? RealFire is a business uh, set up to drive more lending and more investment into emerging markets. It aims to solve the number one challenge faced by small businesses in emerging markets like Africa, which is access to finance. At RealFi, we believe that a business, whether it's in Nairobi, Bogota, uh, should be able to raise off the strength of the actual business, no matter where they're located. And RealFi uses data to enable that to happen. What are some of these challenges and problems that we're seeing within emerging markets? Well, the problems haven't really changed. The number one problem in emerging markets is access to finance. If you think about the way in which Western economies work, a large amount of employment is really driven through large corporates. These are behemoth companies who can raise capital off public markets. And they're really who most people are employed by, if you think about somewhere like the UK. In emerging markets, it's pretty much the opposite. Over 70% of all jobs in emerging markets come from small businesses, or as the Americans would like to say, mum and pop businesses. And 50% of all GDP is driven by these companies, uh, you know, one to five sort of people. So when we think about what we can do to propel growth in emerging markets, it's really about making the fortunes of these small businesses better. And the number one way in which we can do that is access to capital. And that's the space in which RealFi operates. What sort of opportunities does this create within developing economies? So, you know, if you're a small business and you don't have the ability to go to a bank for capital, really your every single day is thought is focused on, do I buy A or do I buy B? Often both A and B could grow your business. It might be, do I buy more inventory as a shop to be able to sell more today. But what if I could also hire someone? So actually I could have a second outlet. So these sort of trade-offs are, are very typical trade-offs. And normally what we'd say in the West is, well, go and borrow some money. So you can do A and B, that way you're gonna maximize your growth. Without the access to capital, obviously you have to pick. You have to do these things from cash flow, which basically massively extends the amount of time it takes for you to grow. The opportunity of being able to provide finance to these businesses is really the opportunity to grow these businesses and therefore grow these economies. So John, let's paint a picture of the current landscape. How are small businesses currently funded within developing economies at the moment? Well, currently it works very badly. You've got to understand the demographics of emerging markets. So you've got 75% of people under the age of 30, in some countries under the age of 25. And this huge huge army of young people are not going to work at large corporates. They're setting up small businesses. 75% of all employment in these markets come from small businesses and 50% of all GDP is derived from it. So the question of how to support these young entrepreneurs is the question of how do we grow these economies? Currently, they're going to banks and banks are uninterested in lending to them. They don't have collateral. They don't have large amounts of transaction history to be able to draw from. And the banks would rather lend to government who's offering them 18%. So this like mismatch between the bank's incentives and the economy's incentive or entrepreneur's needs basically means that they're incredibly poorly served by the financial structures that we have set up today. In our view, supporting this segment is going to be the crucial question for development in Africa and in emerging markets across the next 20 years. And at RealFi, we hope to contribute to that in some small way. And our solution is around data. We hope to use data to be able to prove that the risk of lending to these businesses is actually 
small enough or manageable enough that you can create a commercial model for lending to them. And we hope to rally capital across the world towards that cause. And we don't want it to be about, you know, trust us or trust the small business. We want it to be about trust the data. And that's why we see RealFi as much of a data science business as it is a finance business. We ingest all of this information and we turn it into actionable intelligence for an investor to be able to make a commercial lending decision on. So far, we've done that to the tune of around $5 million. We hope to expand that significantly fourfold by the end of the year and then keep on growing from that. And, you know, through this sort of commercial lending, we also hope to drive huge amounts of impact, whether it's job creation, whether it's carbon sequestration, supporting women entrepreneurs. There are a whole gamut of incredible impact goals, which we believe you can drive whilst also generating commercial returns. And that, that for us is the beauty of, of RealFi, generating good social good whilst still earning you know, reasonable risk adjusted returns. OK, so how do we get there? What does that journey look like for you, John? I think we need to start with our customers. So whilst we want to support these local small businesses, the question is, how do you access them? So what we do is we find what we call fintechs or what the market calls fintechs. These are local technology companies that are specialists in underwriting a particular kind of business. So one fintech who we work with in Kenya, they're all real specialists at underwriting market traders. These are people who are buying and selling grain FMCG goods in small little markets uh, across Nairobi. So this company, this fintech, has the ability to ingest their information, model the risk, and then apply a model to be able to figure out how much should we lend to this business. And they might lend to a few hundred thousand different businesses. But these fintechs, they have the same challenge in raising capital as the businesses that they're supporting. These fintechs, they don't take in retail deposits. They don't have people coming to them each month depositing their income, which enables you know these fintechs to build up a deposit base like a bank. So instead, they need to go and raise capital. And this is where RealFi steps in. What we are is essentially a data science business that ingests all of this information and then builds out our own models over what the risk is of lending to them. And we do this for one fintech, two fintechs, three fintechs, four fintechs. And eventually we end up with really sophisticated understandings of the risk of lending into this particular segment. Actually, we end up with more information than almost anyone else in, in the game. And with all of this information and with these models, what we can do is start to predict what's likely to happen in the future over defaults, write-off rates, etc. With the quality of these predictions, what we can do is go and build structured finance products. So we can go to international capital markets and say, look, don't just trust us, trust the data. Like, Look at the models of which we built, look at the understanding that we have, and that should be able to give you confidence that you can deploy capital through these structures in order to generate not only a strong commercial risk-adjusted return, but also deliver huge impacts along the way. So that's really what we're about at RealFi is you know, using data to be able to give confidence in lending in emerging markets and try to change the conversation a bit away from it's Africa. That sounds horrendously risky to much more. Let's look at the data together and make an investment decision on the basis of that data. So let's talk about the real FI solution. How are you looking to shake up lending within emerging markets? So as I say at RealFi, our goal is to enable more lending to happen into emerging markets. And the way in which we do that is primarily through data. So let's start with our customers. As we've discussed in emerging markets, banks don't lend to real businesses. This has left a massive gap in the market for a new kind of lender. These lenders we call fintechs. They are regulated non-bank lenders. This means that they provide loans to businesses but they don't take in any retail deposits. There's no one coming to them with their salary each month and saying, can you hold this for me? That means that these fintech lenders need to raise capital themselves and they've got to raise it from wholesale capital markets. The irony is it's as difficult for these fintechs to raise capital as it often is for the businesses that they support. They find that on the global stage, no one knows who they are. Big global investment funds find it very difficult to understand the risk of lending to these fintechs. This is where RealFi steps in. We build data integrations that takes all of this information from the fintech and the underlying companies that they're borrowing from. We clean, we standardize, and we interpret this data. 
the quantum of this data is large. For a single fintech, we might have 30 million different data transaction lines, and this is being updated daily. So it's too difficult to open this in Excel, right? A traditional finance firm isn't going to be able to glean meaningful insights from this quantum of data. At RealFi, we do precisely that, and we turn it into clean, easy to action models, which can give investors confidence when they're participating in lending to these entities. So that's the value add that we bring at RealFi is this data-driven underwriting model and ultimately live monitoring of these assets on an ongoing basis. So we're just basically trying to create, you know, this sort of safety harness for participating in emerging markets and to do that through high quality data science and credit models. You mentioned impact there. How do you think this is going to affect the real world? What sort of changes do you think this is going to bring out in our society? Impact is a broad church. And I think if we think about impact investors, there are really lots of different goals which they care about. I think probably the most, how do I put that, the most popular goal at the moment, or at least the most hypey, is really over climate. You know, this has really galvanized the world, the international society and large amounts of capital around trying to hit, you know, climate goals and climate objectives. And there are large amounts of lending which you can do which support that goal. So for instance, you know, there are companies we're diligencing at the moment who are supporting solar home installations. So this is switching people from fossil fuel driven energy towards solar generated energy. And you can create a commercial portfolio around that where you can lend into it at an interest rate while still driving some sort of climate goal. That's you know, a very popular model at the moment. For me, my heart is always going to be around financial inclusion. I believe that goals over generating employment, um, reducing inequality, these are all things which capital can achieve. And a large amount of our lending so far has really been focused on small businesses, which we can help grow, we can increase employment, we can increase household income through lending to, whilst doing this on a commercial basis. So there's many different goals which we can achieve, you know, across both financial inclusion, climate, also gender equality, for the circa $5 million of lending we've done so far in Kenya, 70% of all loans have gone to women-owned businesses, women entrepreneurs. So there's loads of goals there. To a certain extent, from an investor perspective, it's like choose your own adventure. One of the beauties about our model with working with so many different fintechs is that we can sort of generate a portfolio based on the commercial return required from the investor, but also their impact goals. And that's one of the really special things I think about the business model. So, you know, you tell me what impact you want and I'll find you the right fintechs for it. Let's talk about the Cardano model. Um, how do you feel as though Cardano is uniquely positioned to help RealFi with its aims? So there's two parts of this. I think the first part is broader than Cardano. It's a question about real world assets. I believe that there will be across the next five years an increased interest from people holding crypto to be able to lend and access real world assets. And we've seen that already. There's been a few providers who are offering tokenized treasuries, which there's been appetite for. People like to earn around 5% on their USD stablecoin assets in a way that they can understand versus the Celsius model where you have no idea how that yield is being generated. And I think that that's sort of the promise of real world assets is that people can sort of understand what the underlying economic value is. The issue, though, so far has been that it's been very difficult for a lot of Web3 investors to actually understand what the risk is for all of these Web3 assets. So treasuries, very easy to understand. But a lot of the things which were available on Maple were not so easy to understand. And, you know, Alameda Research being one of the, the biggest recipients of funds from Maple is a good example of that. Did people really understand the risk that Sam was creating? in FTX and his associated subsidiaries. They probably didn't. They were looking for yield. And this for me is the gap which we want to play in and realify. We want to bring a data-driven and transparent approach towards the current health and value of these real world assets. And I think that that's useful for the RWA space in general. When it comes towards Cardano, I believe that you know, the community is uh, very social orientated. There's a lot of mission-driven people in Cardano who I believe would like to earn a yield whilst also driving impact. So I think that there's sort of a cultural affinity there. We're not yet at the stage where people holding crypto can, can access the real fire product, but at some point in the future, we do hope to get there. So I would say, yeah, you know, a, a high level of mission alignment Obviously, you know, RealFi is also still very much part of the Cardano family. I've been in the Cardano community for many years. 
So as we evolve, as we get closer towards being able to connect up real fight towards the Web3 space, we hope that there'll be lots of people in Cardano who are interested in supporting. And talking about Web3 more broadly, how do you feel as though Web3 can help fintechs overcome some of the challenges that they're seeing? From a fintech perspective, let's just go back over their basics again. So they can't take deposits. They can't raise funding often from their local market, but they have really great businesses that they want to lend to. The fintech's key problem is where can I raise capital from? And I would say Web3 provides a very interesting route for them. What is Web3 but capital without borders? So from a fintech perspective, if you can prove what the quality of your book is, which is really sort of where RealFi comes about, if you can sort of prove that and signal it to a broader worldwide market of capital, then why shouldn't you be able to go and raise capital through it? And that's really what I've seen from many of the fintechs we've spoken to. They're incredibly excited about being able to get outside of their echo chamber and to be able to participate on a global stage. And that's pretty new and pretty unique. You know, up until this point, you're always sort of trapped. You're a prisoner of your own geography. Web3 really offers, you know, the promise of being able to go beyond that. So, yeah, I would say that they're incredibly excited. Nowhere do you hear more people talk about the future of finance than in emerging markets, probably because the need is greatest. What have you and the Real Fight team been working on recently, John? So we really sort of kicked off in earnest at the beginning of the year. We've spent up until this point really doing two things. One is building out a technology infrastructure. This is the ability to ingest large amounts of data from a variety of different fintechs to be able to clean, standardize, structure, and interpret that. And that interpret part can be quite challenging. What you need for interpret is not just data science, it's also credit models. You need to be able to understand the various different risks, risks of default, risks of FX swings. There's a whole set of them that you need to be able to model effectively for a particular kind of debt. So we've been really building these two capabilities to ingest, clean and structure and interpret large amounts of information. And then, of course, combine that through the perspective of a credit model and do this in an automated, scalable fashion. To a certain extent, we've already achieved that. Um, We've run around $5 million through our model, lending mostly into East Africa, generating strong risk adjusted returns whilst also creating lots of jobs. So this was sort of our MVP phase. Now that we're getting towards the end of that, uh, we're looking to do much brighter and bigger things across the last quarter of the year and going into next. And what's coming up over the next couple of months? What can we expect to see between now and the end of 2024? So I'd say that we've currently built our MVP. We've deployed it. We're running it. It worked. We've lent close to $5 million through these models. We're now expanding that amount. So we're looking to increase that by an additional $20 million uh, with a transaction towards the end of this year. Once we sort of road tested, battle tested this model, then there are tons of improvements that we can make. We can add additional debt classes. Currently, we're really focused on working capital finance for small businesses, but there are other kinds of data rich asset finance, which we can do. In addition, you can add additional geos. We've mostly been lending in East Africa for the moment. I think there's a lot of space to lend into South America and Southeast Asia. And then finally, probably of most relevance to a lot of the people on this call, we're really interested in taking these same models and plumbing it into the Web3 ecosystem. Currently, with real world assets in Web3, you might purchase an asset, but you get very little information about the health of that asset on an ongoing basis. And for us, this creates a ton of risk. It's the reason why when uh, a year and a half ago, a lot of retail customers who were lending through Maple were shocked and appalled to find out that the money they'd been lending to Alameda Research was not AAA, gold, rock solid, but actually was incredibly risky. And this is the kind of thing we see a lot in the industry. So what we're hoping to do is to bring this much more data-driven approach towards understanding the risk and health of real-world assets and basically enable that sort of methodology and philosophy across a broader selection of assets within Web3. So this is something that we're working on at the moment. You'll probably hear more about it in Q1 of next year. So to sort of summarize, we want to grow bigger. We want to learn more additional countries, additional products. And of course, tie this all back in towards the Web3 ecosystem. No, it all sounds very exciting. And I can imagine that a few of our viewers might want to get in touch with RealFi after this. How can they get in touch with you? 
You can find me on Twitter at uh, JJT O'Connor. That's O C O N N O R. There's also our RealFi Twitter and LinkedIn. You can just search RealFi on LinkedIn. On Twitter, I think it's uh, RealFi underscore co. And yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm sure we'll be doing a lot more community engagement and updates next year as our product offering gets a bit more Web3 ready. But uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. We'd love to chat. Thanks for your time today, John. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a while and uh, looking forward to keeping you guys updated in the future.